dear friends, and welcome once again to our virtual Bible study here with Hilldale Baptist Church. It's always so good to have you join us, and uh, it's just great to be a part of studying God's Word with God's people. And uh, let me say that uh, this is something that, that we really enjoy doing. It's not as much fun as it would be if we could all be together in the same room, but uh, as long as uh, our COVID pandemic is still running and uh, moving around on us, well, we are, we are committed here at Hilldale Baptist Church to making sure we can present some, some online uh, worship and online Bible study just so that we can continue to do what we need to do in order to be able to just lift our hearts to the Lord and worship Him and to learn His Word and let me say to you that I am so grateful for the privilege of having you to, to join with me here as we study God's Word together. And let me say to you that, that we are making some progress and pulling some things together at Hilldale Baptist Church. And you may have, uh, well, I, hopefully you've already heard by now, that we are starting three services in the month of October, so you'll want to think in terms of that, and as a matter of fact, the first two services will be at our Madison Street campus, and that will be at 8 o'clock and at 9.30. We will have worship services at Madison, and let me say to you that uh, God willing, uh, we will be fully and completely protected, and we, are, we have made arrangements for complete social distance distancing here in the sanctuary and uh, we are we will be encouraging everyone to continue to wear masks and let me just say to you that that we are hoping and praying that we can just enjoy worship together in our Madison Street sanctuary at 8 30 and at, I'm sorry make that eight o'clock and at 9 30 and then uh, we will have uh, our uh, our worship as we have been having at 11 o'clock at our Family Life Center. So you be sure to keep that in mind, and uh, we will continue to, uh, to we hope, be able to spread out more with some of our worship activities. As a matter of fact, in the month of November, we're planning on even adding uh, another worship service and have, have two worship services going, ongoing simultaneously, one at Madison at, at uh, 9.30, and then one at the Family Life Center at 9.30, because we're hoping by then even more people will feel safe in coming out. So you keep that in mind, and you pray with us about that, and, and we're also working and making progress, we believe, toward being able to do some gathering with uh, some, some life groups, perhaps in the month of November. And so you stay tuned with us, and we'll be saying more about that in the days to come. But in the meantime, once again, thank you for joining with me. Last, last Sunday, last weekend, we started a study in the book of Isaiah. And if you missed last Sunday's lesson, well, you can go back and catch that on our church website. And let me say that we're going to continue that this Sunday. We're looking at... Isaiah chapter 6, and we're going to be doing that here in just a few moments. But before we do that, let me just ask you to just take a few moments and let's just go to the Lord and ask for His hand of blessing and, and a word of prayer and just ask for Him to, to show us what he would, he would have us to learn from His Word. Oh God, we thank You so very much for the privilege of studying the sacred pages of Scripture. Father, thank you for the joy of being able to, to share your word. And Father, thank you for uh, these who are uh, watching uh, online with me now. And God, I thank you because uh, they have tuned in for a desire, oh Lord, to learn more about you, to, to learn your word, God, to be fed, to be nourished. Oh, God, we need that. And we beg you today that you would just simply allow us to take hold of you 
and learn all that you would teach us from your holy word. Father, thank you for what you, you do with that. And Lord, uh, as we come to you in prayer, we're aware that, that uh, so many are struggling right now. And, and dear God, we are aware that uh, uh, some within our church are sick with the COVID virus. And oh, dear Father, we just cry out to you and we ask you to let your healing hand be upon these. Oh, Father, touch them. And just let them feel your healing presence. Father, we pray that uh, the medications would work. We pray that their rest would help them. And Oh, God, we pray that, that your healing hand would do what needs to be done in order to restore health to all of them. God, we pray that you would bless the doctors and the nurses and, and uh, the technicians and and all of the hospital staff and the clinical staff and the medical staff, Lord, uh, who are treating those in the hospital and those at home. And, oh, Father, we pray, Lord, that you would just let your healing be over this, over this city and over this state and over this nation and even all the world, oh, God. Lord, we know that, that there are, there are, there are ways that you will work out all of this for your own glory and honor. And Father, you will do it in such a way that, that it will be for the good of all of us who love you and are called according to your purpose. Oh God, we commit that to you. We cling to that. We trust in you for that and we thank you because we know that you will do that. And Lord, I know that there are many other needs of various types. Father, so many people have suffered for uh, maybe a loss of a job and, and uh, a loss of uh, as much income as they did have and, and various other needs that we have gone through this year in all of these strange and dire circumstances. Oh God, help us, we pray to cling to you and know that you will take care of us. Help us to trust you with that. And Father, we pray that those of us, O oh Lord, who may have something that, that uh, is not right between us and you, touch our hearts. Give us the grace, O oh Lord, to fall before you in confession and repentance. Help us, O oh God, to find your love and forgiveness and help us to cling to you and to walk with you and to serve you. And now, dear Father, as we look into your word, Father, I humbly pray that you would just pour out your spirit upon me and, and help me, God, to share your word. Lord, you do the teaching. Lord, you cause all our hearts to hear what your Holy Spirit will say. And Father, we will give you praise and give you thanks for all the good things that you do. Go with us now in this time of learning. Thank you, O oh God, for what you will do. In the name of Jesus, we ask all these things. Amen. Amen. All right. Today we're looking at Isaiah chapter 6, and we're going to study the entire chapter, verses 1 through 13. The title of our lesson today is God Sins. And uh, our background text is actually all of chapters 5 and 6, beginning in chapter, one, chapter 5, verse 1, going through the end of chapter 6, verse 13. But uh, we will be saying a little bit more about chapter 5 as a part of our background text in just a few minutes. But before we get into all of that, let me take you through a few items of introduction about Isaiah and today I'd like to share with you a little bit more about the kings that Isaiah uh, uh, prophesied while he, was, while he was doing his ministry, uh, the kings that he prophesied under. All right, Isaiah is one of the more eloquent prophets in the Bible. Uh, this man Isaiah was uh, a very well-educated man, and, and, uh, and it's fascinating because there's very little biographical information about Isaiah, uh, as opposed to Jeremiah, for example. Jeremiah wrote several long sections in his book about things that happened to him during his life and ministry. 
But we have very little of that in Isaiah. Uh, there's one or two incidents that it talks about, uh, particularly as it related to one or two of the kings that he served under. But we're told there in chapter 1, verse 1, that Isaiah was the son of Amoz. And uh, later on in the book, we learn that uh, Isaiah was married. And by the way, we don't know his wife's name, but he called her the prophetess. And we don't know if that means that she actually had a gift of prophecy and did some prophesying. We don't have any of her prophecies recorded in the Bible. But uh, it may be that he simply gave her that name because she was the wife of a prophet. She was his wife. And uh, so we're told that, and then we're also told that Isaiah bore two sons with her. And we're given those names, and I don't have those names in front of me, but, but, uh, but this is about all we really learn about the prophet Isaiah as a person, uh, except for just little incidental things that we pick up through the book. We also learn that, that uh, he was a prophet under four kings of Judah. And I'd like for us to take a look at those four kings so you will know a little bit about uh, the type of uh, environment that Isaiah lived through and uh, the various political arenas that, that he wa was, was dealing with uh, while, uh, or he, the, 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 the types of arenas that he dealt with while he was, while he was prophesying. The first king that it names that Isaiah lived under was King Uzziah. Now, King Uzziah was also known as King Azariah in the book of 2 Kings. He was a godly king, and uh, the nation prospered, uh, prospered under him. Judah grew to be a very powerful nation. Uh, Uzziah managed to build up the army, the military, and Uzziah was a very ingenious person. He was able to build some engines of war, the Scripture says. And he was able to keep Judah under good military protection. Uh, but then when, when uh, uh, Uzziah grew much older, even though he had been a very godly man and a godly king through his life, at one point he developed a great deal of personal pride. And, and for some reason he decided he wanted to offer the sacrifice uh, of incense in the temple. Now, only the priests were allowed to do this. This is what God had specified in his law. But Uzziah went in there and he started to burn the sacrifice. And when he did, the scripture tells us that leprosy broke out upon him. And he was immediately rushed out by the priests. And uh, then he went, had to live in seclusion for the rest of his life. And then the second king that Isaiah prophesied under uh, was Uzziah's son by the name of Jotham. Now Jotham was also a godly king, although he did not seem to be quite as godly as his father. Uh, but uh, but he, he gained victory over the Ammonites. However, Joth Jotham did not allow uh, or did not uh, prompt the people to stay away from offering sacrifices in some of the high places and on some of the high altars that were, were illegal for the Jews to do. The third king of Isaiah's ministry was Ahaz. Uh, Ahaz was not a godly king. Ahaz was a very weak king, and he, he cowered under the pressure of a lot of the leaders and under him to, to allow for for uh, altars and statues to be erected as idols to, for Baal and, and Baal worship and various other things such as that. And uh, the people uh, uh, eventually wound up uh, making sacrifices to these. And, and, uh, and Isaiah warned Ahaz that judgment would come as a result of that. But the fourth king that Isaiah served under was a king whose name was Hezekiah. And we know a little more about Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a godly king. And the scripture tells us that uh, God protected him and blessed him when the uh, Assyrian armies came and they, and they conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. Judah remained safe. And God actually slaughtered the army 
uh, of the Assyrians who had come to conquer Judah. And uh, this was in response to the prophecy of Isaiah as, as Hezekiah had, uh, had asked him uh, for a word from the Lord. And, and so God richly blessed with this. And there was a one point at which uh, Hezekiah grew very sick and the scripture says that Isaiah prophesied and told him that, that he would recover from his sickness, and he did. So that helps us to understand some of the ministry that Isaiah had, and we'll be talking a good bit more about that in days to come. The general outline of Isaiah uh, can be set up within four major parts, and uh, actually it can go uh, uh, much in much more detail with the outline than these four major parts, but just to make it a little simpler for our presentation, uh, in the first 12 chapters, we find that Isaiah devotes this to a rebuke of the kingdom of Judah because they were falling into sin, and he also talked about the promise of Emmanuel uh, that would be coming. And we remember some of the prophecies of that. As a matter of fact, we'll be talking about some of that next week in our Bible study. And then chapters 13 through 39, we find a judgment that Isaiah preaches to the nations. But then in chapter 40, the book takes a major turn as Isaiah begins to talk about God's greatness and all that God would do after the time of, of uh, the captivity of the Jews. And then finally in chapters 49 through 66, there is a section on the great, great gift of peace that God brings to the people. All right, last week we got started in Isaiah, and in our previous lesson there, we saw how that God is disgusted with the people in their hypocrisy, and God was commanding the people to repent. Now in today's lesson, we're going to see how Isaiah had a vision of the glory of God in the temple. And then I, God calls out and he says, Who will go forth? Who shall I send to preach to my people? And Isaiah cries out and he says, Here am I, send me. And this will be our study here today. In our background text in chapter 5, I'd like to just share with you quickly what's, what's happening there. But in the first seven verses, it's very interesting because there's a parable that Isaiah tells there comparing the nation of Israel to a vineyard of wild grapes. Uh, and then in the latter part of chapter 5, verses 8 through 30, Isaiah is presenting a series of woes in which he's crying out and forecasting great judgment on all of the the different wicked practices of the people of Israel. All right, well, that concludes our introduction here and some of the background information. Now I'd like to ask you to look with me at today's focal text, and we'll begin reading here in Isaiah chapter 6. So if you would, take your Bible and read with me, beginning in verse 1 of Isaiah 6, and we'll read through verse 4. Our uh, section title for this part of the lesson is God's glory. Now I'll be reading out of the New American Standard Version of the Bible. You follow along with me in whatever version you may have or just follow along on the screen with us. Beginning in verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 6, it says, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with a train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold trembled at the voice of of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. All right, let's talk about these four verses for just a few minutes. There in verse 1, it starts out talking about the year of King Uzziah's death. 
Now, Isaiah is speaking here in a first-person uh, type, of, type of narrative, and, and he's saying, I was in the temple uh, in, the, in the, the, the year of King Uzziah's death. Now, it's very interesting that he mentions the death of King Uzziah. Uh, that very year he's talking about, he remembered this vision that he had, and obviously for him to remember the year of King Uzziah's death, uh, Isaiah had to be mourning, and he had to be grieving over the death of King Uzziah. And by the way, that also for us, it helps us to date when this very vision took place because Bible scholars generally date Uzziah's reign from 792 until his death in 740 B.C. So that means that this would have been the year 740 B.C. before Christ when, when Isaiah had this vision in the temple. And this is what he saw. It says in the last part of the verse, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with a train of his robe filling the temple. Now, it's important to be aware that this is a vision that Isaiah is having. It's not as though he is literally seeing God, because the scripture makes it very clear that God did not appear directly to men in this way. The closest that Anyone ever came to that was Moses, and God told Moses, he said, you cannot look directly on my face and live. And the Bible says that God put Moses in a cleft of a rock, and he placed his hand over that cleft or that crack, and then God said, okay, I will pass by and I will cover your, uh, your sight with my hand as you were there in that uh, crack in the rocks, rock here on the mountainside. And when, Isaiah, when God walked by, the scripture says, he pulled his hand back and Moses was able to see God's back directly. But he was never allowed to look directly on his face because it would have killed him. Well, Isaiah was seeing a vision here in, in chapter 6. And uh, this vision... To, uh, was, was one in which God was seated on his throne, high and exalted. And as he was there on his throne, the scripture says that his elegant, majestic robe filled the entire temple. The hem of his robe fell all the way down to the floors of the temple. And, uh, and perhaps maybe even piled up some on the floor because it was so long. Now this would have been an awesome, awesome sight to see someone whose robes were literally that long because only the very wealthiest of individuals in Isaiah's time could wear any kind of a long robe, but for someone to have a robe this long was beyond imagination. And this is what Isaiah saw as, as, he, as he encountered the majesty of the Lord. Then in verse 2, it says, Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. Now, what in the world is this? Well, we know very little about Seraphim. They are angelic creatures. And according to ancient Jewish tradition, the Seraphim were the second highest order of angels. The first highest order of angels, again, according to Jewish tradition, were the cherubim. And by the way, when you see words like cherubim and seraphim and a few other words like this we have in the Bible, uh, in the Old Testament, uh, you can uh, be aware that those are Hebrew words and the, the letters I am on the end of the words means they're in the plural. Seraphim is plural for seraph. That's the singular. Just like cherubim is plural for the singular word cherub. But, uh, but you had the, uh, the, the cherub uh, the, or the cherubim and then the seraphim. And then we have two other uh, orders of angels listed in the Bible. We have the archangel and the angel. The ancient Jewish tradition says there were three more types of angels who were in between, 
uh, the, the seraph and, uh, and the archangel, but we don't have those named in the Bible, so we can't be sure that that's actually the order that God has in heaven. Nonetheless, uh, the seraphim are named here in God's Word. And uh, these seraphim were, were angelic beings with six wings. And it describes uh, the two wings that they had as covering the face, and two more wings as covering their feet. And, of course, with the other two wings, they were flying. Now, what's all this about? Well, scholars are convinced that the, the seraphim were covering their face because they could not look on all of the brilliance of God's dazzling glory. And so they had to, had to cover their faces to shroud their faces from, from all the brightness of God's glory. And then they covered their feet because they were embarrassed and ashamed for their feet to be in God's presence. The feet are the dirtiest part of the person. And therefore, they did not want God to, to be able to see their feet. But then with the other two wings, they were flying. And the reason they were flying about is because they were just celebrating the majesty and the glory of the presence of, of, of God. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so in verse 3, it, it tells us that one seraph called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. So these beings were calling out in chorus to one another and praise to God. And they were doing this three times. Uh, they were saying the word holy. And that indicated the highest and the most glorious form of praise. Like uh, we, we can use the word uh, 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 fast and then uh, the, the secondary expression of comparative significance. We would say uh, one is faster. And then if we're talking about three or more, we'd say he is the fastest. And so therefore, uh, we have uh, a, 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 a normal or a standard adjective and then a comparative adjective with an ER ending and a superlative adjective with an EST ending. Well, in the same way, the, in the Hebrew, they were expressing the fact that God was the holiest of all, and therefore they would do this by the threefold use of the word holy. Sometimes you'll hear preachers preach and talk about the thrice holy God. Uh, that's holy three times. And that, that means he's holy in the highest way. And so uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful, uh, glorious type of expression to denote the greatness and the holiness of God. And in the second part of verse 3, it talks about how the whole earth is full of his glory. And so they were declaring that God's glory is so great that it stretched over the expanse of the entire world. And uh, certainly, we don't have any problem understanding uh, the great glory of God in nature. Now, man has done much, much to muck up the, the, the natural scenes and, and beauty and wonder of, of God's created world. Nonetheless, we're all aware that uh, uh, nature in its, in, its, uh, in its beauty and in its pristine glory is a beautiful thing. And certainly, it reflects the greatness of God. All right, let's look at verse 4. Notice it says that the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out. Now, this is an amazing statement because what it's actually saying here is it's saying that the foundation stones of the temple were actually shaking under the tremendous uh, pressure of the sound of the, seraph, the sounds of the seraphim as they were uh, calling out holiness to God. And uh, that's, that's certainly saying something amazing because those stones were huge. They were extremely heavy. And let me say to you that it would have taken a lot of vibration to have rattled those stones. But that's exactly what was happening. 
And then it says in the second part of verse 3, I'm sorry, second part of verse 4, that while the temple, this was happening, while the temple was filling with smoke. Now, this may have been smoke from the sacrifices of the temple courts uh, that was amplified in the presence of God, but, but more properly, it could have referred to the smoke of the glory of God. You see, many times in the Old Testament in particular, you see where uh, there is this uh, expression of God's presence with, uh, with a smoke and with a cloud. For example, there was the cloud that, that followed the tabernacle in the wilderness. And then there was the, the Shekinah glory, the smoke that came down upon the tabernacle. And when Solomon dedicated the temple, uh, there was a tremendous smoke and uh, a, a, a cloud that came out of the temple as God sent down fire uh, to uh, burn the sacrifices. And it was a, a, a majestic and an awesome sight for the people when God uh, caused his temple to be dedicated during the time of Solomon. All right, that concludes the first section of our lesson. And now let's move on to our second section, which is Isaiah chapter 6, verses 5 through 7. And our, our section title there is God's Forgiveness. So you follow along with me, beginning in verse 5 of Isaiah chapter 6. And this is what it says. Isaiah continues to speak and he says, Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongues. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. All right, this is a very fascinating and strange passage that we have here. Let's take a look at what it's saying. Beginning there in verse 5, notice it says, Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined. Now, this is Isaiah's first direct speech concerning himself when he's actually doing a little kind of monologue in the book. And uh, this term, woe, is a cry of absolute despair. Now, now he's, uh, he's already pronounced some woes against uh, some of the evil practices of, uh, of the nation there in chapter 5. But now he's saying, woe is me. He says, uh, he says I I'm ruined. I I'm doomed. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But the point is, he is in absolute despair and hopelessness. Now, why does he say this? Well, it's because of the fact that he is convinced he's about to be plunged into complete destruction. He's doomed. And that's actually what the phrasing here of this statement is all about. And then in the second part of verse 5, he tells us why. He says, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So Isaiah is very well aware of the fact that he has seen God. Now, he, he knows the fact that, that this is a vision, but still, he is so overwhelmed that he thinks he is about to die, and that's a part of what the problem is. He's been looking upon God. But the second thing is the fact that he knows that he is a sinful human being. And he knows that he comes from a whole generation, a whole world of sinful human beings. And so he says, I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell among a people of unclean lips because my eyes have seen the, the King, the Lord of hosts. Now, you have to understand that when he talks about unclean lips, that is symbolic of the fact that he's talking about an unclean life. And he's saying that I am an unclean person and all of the people that I live among are unclean people. And God, 
will not tolerate my presence like this. And he is frightened. He is terrified. And he knows that his sin has doomed him before God. And let me say to you, dear friends, that if we all stood before God on our own, if we all stood before God uh, within our own righteousness, within our own integrity, and we are in God's presence, let me tell you, we would all be so frightened that uh, it, would, it would just completely uh, consume us. We couldn't stand it because we would immediately know that we would, were sinful people in the presence of a most holy God. And so therefore, uh, it, it's very important that we understand the fact that, that, uh, that, we, that, that, that we have to come clean before God. And that's how Isaiah was feeling. He didn't know what he was going to do. But then God had mercy on him. Look at verse 6. It says, Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongues. Now, the word seraph actually on its own means flaming one. And so these angels, these angelic beings called the seraphim, they were like flames of fire. And so it seemed very appropriate that they would be the ones to go to the altar and take the fire, take a flaming fiery coal with the, with the tongs and then place them on, on uh, Isaiah's lips. And it says that, uh, that they, they did this so that an escape would be prepared for Isaiah. Then we see what happened in verse 7. It says, He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips and your iniquity is taken away and your sin is covered or forgiven. The touching of this flaming coal to Isaiah's lips in this vision is a symbolic gesture of Isaiah's sins being cleansed and washed away. The purging of his sin. Uh, there is there, Notice it talks about how that his iniquity is taken away and his sin is forgiven. I think that could be referring to his iniquity or tendency for wrongdoing is lifted off of his life. And his sin is forgiven. The, all of the black marks against him, they've all been wiped away. And dear friend, let me say, when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, that's exactly what happens. There are two wonderful ways in which God changes you. First of all, He forgives you of your sin. He wipes your sin slate clean. And you are no longer guilty for all of the wrong and wicked and evil things that you've ever done. But secondly, God also takes away your uh, enslaved tendency to sin. God gives you a new power to overcome sin. And, uh, and, and, and as a result... Uh, you can say no to the, to the wicked temptations that come across your life. And so this word forgiven means covered over or atoned for. And these were dealt with by God for the prophet Isaiah. All right, that concludes our second section. Now let's look at the third section quickly. Uh, Isaiah chapter 6, verses 8 through 10. It's God's call. So begin reading with me, if you will, in, in uh, chapter 6, beginning in verse 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. He said, Go and tell this people, Keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive their ears dull, and their eyes dim. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. Now this is a very strange passage of Scripture. Let's see if we can understand what it is that the Word is saying. There in verse 8 it says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. 
God has a mission. God has a purpose that he wants someone to go on. Now, after Isaiah's lips were purged of sin, Isaiah was a fit and a clean, available vessel. And God certainly wanted Isaiah to do this. And uh, God did not appoint him to do this immediately, but instead he gave him the opportunity to offer to be used by him to accomplish his work. And folks, let me say this to you. God will never force you into doing his will, but he wants to involve you in his great work. And so therefore, he will call and he is waiting for you to answer. And so this is a very wonderful thing that, that God does this. It was always God's intention to send Isaiah, but he offered him this opportunity to be blessed in volunteering to do his work. All right, let's, put, let's pick it up with verse 9. Notice it says there, He said, Go and tell this people, Keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Now, that message that Isaiah was to give to the people was crouched in this poetic statement. Now, this is what we have talked about in the past as Hebrew synonymous parallelism. What you have is two parallel lines that are synonymous with each other. Notice it says, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Those two lines say almost exactly the same thing but they use slightly different words. And in doing that, they add emphasis and they, they uh, uh, lend uh, much more meaning to one another. And so what God was doing is he was simply saying that these people would be so stubborn, they would, they would be so rebellious that they would not really hear and, and receive the message of God. Oh, they would listen. And they would look, but they simply would not receive God's message. And so therefore, uh, in verse 10, notice what he says. He says, Isaiah, you render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull and their eyes dim. Now, the people had already crossed this line of no return. God determined that their senses would be dulled so that his own compassion would not be wasted on them. They had already hardened their, their hearts to a point of no return. And so God was not going to waste any more time with them. Uh, and so he just says, I'll, Isaiah, I will allow your message to just harden them even further. It's a very, very similar th type of thing that he did with Pharaoh. People have asked for many years, why would God harden Pharaoh's heart? Well, God simply hardened a heart that was already hard. He just allowed it to grow harder in order that he might finish what needed to be finished and do the work that he had to perform. And so, in the second part of verse 10 here, we find that, that uh, God continues to say, Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and return and be, be healed. You say, well, well, pastor, doesn't that mean that, that, uh, that, that God uh, is trying to keep them from seeing with their eyes or, or hearing with their ears or understanding? Uh, isn't that what this is saying? Oh, no. No, the message that God gave to Isaiah simply would completely harden their rebellious hearts. Now, if they were not already so rebellious, they would turn and repent and come back to the Lord. But that would not happen with these people. That's what God was saying. All right, and finally, we come to the very last section of our lesson. It's called God's Persistence, and it's verses 11 through 13 of Isaiah chapter 6. Read along with me, beginning in verse 11. It says, Then I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, until cities are devastated and without inhabitant, houses are without people, and the land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men far away and the for 
second places are many in the midst of the land. Yet there will be a tenth portion in it. It will again be subject to burning like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. What do these words mean? Well, in verse 11 there, Isaiah says, Lord, how long? And God answered, and he said, Until cities are devastated without inhabitant, houses are without people, and the land is utterly desolate. What is he saying? Well, Isaiah was asking, how long was he supposed to preach? How long is this going to last? How long will it take? Well, God says it should continue on until the day that absolute desolation takes place. Total destruction, total annihilation, so that all sin is destroyed and cleansed away. Friends, let me say to you that God will not tolerate sin forever. There's much sin in, in the earth right now. There's much sin in this world. But let me say to you that the Bible prophesies very clearly that the day will come when God will wipe the sin from planet earth. And it will be a horrible day for many people. And uh, that will happen because God cannot stand the presence of sin. And someday God is going to right every wrong. He is going to cleanse every sin. And he is going to take the wickedness away from planet earth. And he's doing a little bit of that here in uh, chapter 6 of the book of Isaiah. And so God is saying that, uh, that, 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 ref- that destruction would take place in the cities and the people would come to a loss. The cities would be without inhabitants. And what would happen to the people? Well, most of them would be destroyed. But notice in verse 12, it says, The Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many, In the midst of the land. So here we have a prophecy of the captivity toward Babylon. And uh, the scripture tells us about how the people were taken captive and they remained in Babylon for 70 years. But it wasn't all of the people of Judah, Uh, it was only a small fraction, what the Bible describes as a remnant. All the rest of the people were destroyed except for just a few stragglers who were left in the outlying areas of the land. The the land would become desolate, and the cities would become uninhabited. And that's what God has has talked about here. But what about that remnant? Well, we're, we're told about them actually in verse 13. Take a look at verse 13. It says, Yet there will be a tenth portion in it, and it will again be subject to burning. Now, what does that mean? Isaiah is prophesying that one-tenth of the people will survive, and through them the nation of Israel will start again. Now, you say, do you mean that uh, God is going to actually pull out his calculator and he's going to uh, count every single person that's in the nation of Judah, and he's going to to divide that number by 10 precisely, and it's going to be that many people. No, it's not like that. The numbers in the Scripture are often symbolic. And let me say that this seems to represent a symbolic statement of the number of people. You see, one-tenth would be a very small fraction of people. Uh, But it is enough to a point where it could be noticeable, so to speak. It would be enough to show that, that, uh, that the presence of the people was not totally annihilated. And that's the idea here with one-tenth. One-tenth of the people will survive, and through them the nation will restart. But it says they will be subject to a burning or a further judgment. Now, what does this mean? That, that they're going to encounter uh, death and destruction and captivity? No, I don't think it means that in this case. This burning probably is referring to uh, a type of judgment that will fall upon the people uh, in order to to, uh, 
<coughs> excuse me, to spiritually enlighten them, to discipline them, to, uh, to uh, allow them to, to, uh, to, to be shapen and molded into the people that God wanted them to become. And we know that when the Babylonian captives came back to the land of Israel uh, after the 70 years, the scripture tells us that, that uh, they had a real hard time in the land. They had a real hard time building the temple. They had a hard time building the wall around Jerusalem. And you can read all about that in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And so God was allowing the people to, to learn to totally trust him. Now, let's, let's look at uh, the very last part of verse 13. Notice that Isaiah continues and he says that, uh, that they will be like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. So he's saying that, that this one-tenth of the people will be like a stump of the tree that's left on the ground. Now, we're all aware of the fact that, uh, that a stump can actually leave its roots in the ground and, and, uh, and, and, and sometimes it can, it can draw moisture from those roots and it can sprout and it can begin to grow again. And that's exactly what Isaiah's talking about here. Now, the terebinth, we all know what an oak tree is, but a terebinth tree is one of the old types of turpentine trees. I'm not sure if uh, any of those... Uh, have grown in America, but, but certainly they had them over in the land of Palestine and, and over, in the, uh, over in, the, in the Middle East. And so what he's saying here is God's people will be just like that stump. Uh, there will be a remnant, and they will once again survive and grow as a nation. Well, that completes our lesson today. Our lesson for next week is uh, out of Isaiah chapter 7. It's verses 7 through 17. We're going to be talking about God's promises. And we will be talking about how Isaiah prophesied that, that the virgin would give birth to a son and his name would be called Emmanuel. Now that's a little bit of a vague prophecy. It's a little bit strange to know how to interpret that within its context. But we'll talk about that some next week. But in the meantime, let me just say to you, it's been wonderful having you here with us today. And I really so much appreciate you uh, spending your time with me here as we study God's Word. And God willing, we will continue to do this for as long as uh, we are not totally 100% put back together into life groups here at Hilldale Baptist Church. God bless you so much. Thank you for joining me. Let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father, thank you so much for the lessons we learned from the great prophecy of Isaiah. Oh God, help us to take these truths and apply them to our lives. Help us to grow closer to you in all that we do and all that we say. Lord, help us to truly reach out to you and cling to you and put our hopes in you and in your promises and, oh, God, we will thank you because we know that you are faithful. Go with everyone. Keep them safe this week. Bring us back to rejoice in you next week. It's all in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you, and have a wonderful week.